You know a nice piece of salmon in the grocery store when you see one, right? Maybe not. A study in the U.S. found that about a third of all seafood was not what those selling it claimed it was. And it's not just seafood. Food fraud happens with everything from honey to hamburger, as our global food system can make it hard to know for sure what you're getting. Joining us now for a better understanding of food fraud and what we can do about it. Robert Hanner, he's Associate Director for the Canadian Barcode of Life Network at the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario at the University of Guelph. Sylvain Chalabois, Dean of Management and Professor in Food Distribution and Policy at Dalhousie University. And our familiar food faces, Joshna Maharaj, chef and food activist, Jamie Kennedy from Jamie Kennedy Kitchens. And it's great to welcome you two back. Thank you. Sylvain, Thank it's nice you. to have you here on the set for a change instead of on the satellite, uh, which is yes. how we've usually met. And for the first time, nice to have you here as well. Thank you. Nice I'm going you. to invite everybody else to just sort of sit tight because I want to get uh, uh, with Robert here a better understanding of what your mission in life is right now, starting with DNA bar coding. What is that? It's a solution to a problem. So the problem is that our planet is biodiverse. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many species we share the planet with. And those that we have identified um, can be challenging to account for. Now, this biodiversity provides ecosystem services upon which we all depend. In the Anthropocene, we're changing our world rather dramatically through things like climate change. So we need to understand how we're impacting biodiversity, and we need better approaches to monitor it. So what's your mission involved with that? So our mission is to build a, a DNA-based identification system for all of life. You're trying to code all of life? Everything? We're, we're trying to build a digital identification system for life on our planet. That's animals, that's plants, that's... Fungi, protists in the soils. Um, it's a big challenge. Uh, so we've been working on traditional taxonomic approaches of... What's uh, a taxonomic approach? Uh, well, to us, identifying species, we look at differences in their shape, size, distribution, behaviors. Uh, these are all sort of proxies for uh, understanding what species are. Uh, but trying to go out and do a biosurvey uh, let's say in uh, a park, would require a lot of different specialists who can identify each of these different groups. So butterflies, wasps, plants. Uh, you need a lot of taxonomic expertise to go out and identify things. This is where the barcode metaphor comes in. We think about those of us who are old enough to remember a time before the universal product codes on grocery store products. The clerk had to type in the price of each one. Uh, with the introduction of the universal product code and combining that sort of uh, numeric identification key that we put on products with information systems, we can just scan that barcode and know attributes about that product, its cost, mm -hmm. so it ex expedites not only checking out at the grocery store, but tracing the movement of these goods in the supply so chain. So you're going to put a barcode on every single animal, fish, human, blade of grass, plant, tree? Well, for the species level identification, okay. right? So that's, that was the big breakthrough at the University of Guelph by my colleague, Polly Bear, was to recognize that short standardized gene reads uh, could be used to tell species apart. So we are now building a library of expert identified reference specimens where we profile their DNA sequence in this little barcode region put that into the database, and now we can use that as a lookup table to ID unknowns. So presumably anybody anywhere in the world can have access to this and you share all this information? Is that how it works? Exactly right. So this is, this, the International Barcode of Life Project is a, a multinational research, uh, mega science research agenda to build this digital identification system for life on Earth. And by publicly hosting the Barcode of Life data systems or bold at the University of Guelph, we're democratizing access to biodiversity information. And like the universal product code on canned goods and things, this DNA barcode, why it's such an advance and a solution to the problem of how we monitor biodiversity is that it can be automated and done in high throughput. So it now allows us to actually start to identify species uh, from their DNA in mixtures or uh, you know, in processed products. So it has a lot of applications. One last question. How long is this going to take? Well, we've been working to describe species over the last 250 years. Since Linnaeus and Darwin, we've described about 1.7 million species using traditional approaches. Uh, we don't know how many species we share our planet with, 
But in the last five years, we've cataloged 5 million specimens from 500,000 species. So we've got a long ways to go, but we can do this in a much more rapid uh, way by using this digital DNA-based identification system coupled with an informatics mm. platform to share that information. We think probably two to three decades mm. with a concerted effort from researchers around the world, we can build that catalog mm. of life. And as we segue into a discussion about food fraud, how does what you're doing connect to that? That's an excellent question, and it was one that took me a bit by surprise. So my initial role in the barcode uh, research program was to help coordinate building the barcode library for fishes. So we've been working with colleagues around the world to genetically profile the different species of fishes. And along the way, uh, one of my former graduate students said, you know, I wonder if our database is getting mature enough that if we went out into the marketplace and just bought fish, if we could actually get a species level ID on it. And what we found at that time was that yes, we could put a species level ID on everything we had tested. Our database was maturing, uh, but what we weren't prepared for was the fact that about one in four of the fillets that we tested were mislabeled. Hmm. Always a species of a lower economic value being substituted in for one of a higher value. This is a form of food fraud. Well, okay, the perfect segue to the next. Sylvan, give us I mean, that's a good specific example of what food fraud is. How widespread do you think it is out there? We don't know for sure. Uh, what we kind of know is that there are areas in the world where it's worse than others. And I would say that Europe right now, it's a very difficult place. Uh, there's lots of uh, counterfeiting going on just because of the fact that there's, there's Eastern U Europe and Western Europe. There's lots of exchanges going on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent a year last year in Austria looking at this issue, and there's, there's a big problem there. Uh, in Italy, northern Italy, in, in Germany, uh, in uh, Bulgaria, Romania, there's, there's, there are problems. The horse meat scandal back in 2012 really uh, pointed to that problem. What was that scandal? Well, essentially, <laughs> you had Tesco, a major uh, British retailer, uh, it, find out, it, it found out that actually instead of beef in its lasagna, uh, under its private label, uh, they found actually horse meat instead. And of course, in England, eating horse doesn't really go well. And so <laughs> it was a big problem, a big scandal. And it took months to understand where the problem actually was. And they figured out that there are tons of people within the food system that actually they buy and sell products without even seeing it or touching it ever. Well, this is what I'm wondering. You're, you're convinced this is not a case of sort of carelessness or just not knowing. This is intentional fraud. You're, you're, somebody's intending that it's product A, but in fact, they know it's product B. This is what we call economically motivated adulteration in our language, okay? Economically motivated Adulteration. 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 Okay. There's an economic purpose to, uh, to this kind of behavior, obviously. But what the real problem is that there are many, many agents, uh, brokers, restaurants that are involved in the food system that aren't aware that they're actually selling products that, are, that have been counterfeited. That's the real issue. Okay, let's get our chefs into this. Do you, I mean, is this something you have dealt with in the past? Yes, for sure this is a real thing. I have actually previously just understood it as greenwashing, right? Because there's people telling you that things are from local farms and when they're, they're really not, they're, they're actually imported thing or, or, or specifically around the way animals get raised, right? There's so many different criteria that people just sort of tell you one thing. They say things are naturally raised, which actually means nothing. Right, um, and the cage freeness around eggs and birds is not the only criteria that we need to know about to 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 be confident that we're buying well-raised chickens and eggs. Uh, so we see it all the time, and I'm constantly pushing suppliers, asking more questions about farms, about about growing practices, all of that, just to see how serious and legitimate they actually are. And in your experience, do you think you have been on the receiving end of, what did you call it again, that some kind of adulteration? Economically Economic motive, motivated, <laughs> motivated adulteration, 100%. You've been on the receiving end oh, of that. Oh, for sure. For what kind of product? Uh, all sorts of things. There was bacon once, there were uh, berries. Somebody tried to tell me that there were Ontario strawberries completely out of season, but they were standing on, you know what I mean? They were convinced that they had had some special access to some special growing, I don't know what, how they were saying that, you know, Mother Nature had offered them some special opportunity. Uh, but all the t I see it very frequently. Huh. Jamie, how about you? Do you run into this in your life? Yes, but, <clears throat> you know, I'm interested in, in the impact that 
food fraud would have on sustainability and the cost of food and the real cost of food. Because I, think, I think that's really the issue. As we become more involved with local food procurement practices, this kind of dialogue that we can have Wait. with people in our local areas that produce food for us, I think we can identify what's going on and there's, there's a more of a trustworthy relationship going on there where we actually do see and touch the food and understand where it came from more than if we're looking at a more of a global model where it's buyer beware. Well, I get why trust is an issue. Yeah. Obviously, if you, if you think you're buying grade A steak and it's actually horse meat, there's a problem there. But if you're the consumer and you can't tell the difference, is this a problem? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to buyer beware. So is this how we need to approach all of our purchasing? When we walk into a store, we kind of go, Ugh. So I would welcome something like an, an identification model with using some kind of technology that would allow me to trace, like to actually like point a, an object. Sylvain, I know that you have been talking about this. What does that thing look like? You said it wasn't an app. What is it? Well, it's in development. There are several, mm -hmm. as a result of the horse meat scandal in Europe, there are several universities in Europe that are actually looking at developing a portable technology that would empower the consumer at retail. Imagine mm -hmm. the day that all of us would be able to police the supply chain at the point of purchase. So of course, if, you, if the entire supply chain knows that, it enforces discipline across the supply chain. Because right now, of course, thinking that the CFIA can regulate everything or OMAF in Ontario or municipalities with restaurants uh, is, is, is impossible. No, they can't do the job. No. So presumably you see a day when you can take your smartphone, there's an app on it, you point it at a product and it... Last year in Innsbruck, we took some apples. They were labeled from Italy, northern Italy. We brought them to the lab. We figured out that these apples were grown in Spain. And so the label Italy was used to increase prices. Because if something's from, in that case, the product being from Italy meant you could charge more for it? Exactly. People would consider it of dearer value. Absolutely. Huh. So to build on Jamie's point about food, food prices, I think that's really the issue here. Uh, hmm. Because of food fraud, uh, food prices are probably 20%, uh, 30% lower than they actually should. If we don't tackle the whole issue of food fraud, everything we're trying to do to increase the top line of companies, restaurants, can be jeopardized because of that trust that we need uh, in order to, to build a business. Because people are eating less, we're getting older, we're not buying as much. Last year, for the first time in Canada, in volume, we're buying less food. Revenues are up because we're charging more, mm. but in volume, it is decreasing. So companies like Maple Leaf or anybody involved in the, in, in the food business will have to figure out ways to increase their business. And the only way to do it is to focus on niche markets like, for example, animal welfare, you know, capitalizing on these issues, organics. Because that gives you license to charge more. It will be the only way to grow the food business for the next decade or two. And if you don't have that trust, you won't be able to do it. Robert, what's the gizmo, for lack of a better word, that you see in the future that's going to allow a consumer to determine the true, I don't know if the, do you use the word provenance in the, in the yeah. food world? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Pro, okay, provenance of a, of, a, of a food item. Well, it's not just uh, universities in, in Europe. The University of Guelph is Canada's food university is also working on this kind of problem. We've been using DNA-based approaches to identify foodborne pathogens uh, for some time. So we've been developing kits to allow species ID that can be used in the same instrumentation that our food QAQC labs are already using to test for microbial pathogens, but can now also do uh, this kind of species verification testing. We've also developed a tool out of the University of Guelph called Life Scanner, where people can use a kit through their cell phone to scan a vial, put a bit of food sample in it, send it to the lab, and then have the results of the test emailed back to them. So we're empowering consumers to be able to identify what they're eating or what pests may be in their garden. Uh, hmm. And that, to me, is really exciting. And the pace of this kind of technological development just keeps accelerating. Interesting. Uh, tell me something. Uh, you've given the example of berries. Yes. 
What's the one food that you would assume is the easiest to defraud the public with? I think that the fish and seafood game yeah, is probably the loudest racket there. Uh, yeah. How come? Yeah. Uh, well, because there's there's a lot that's unknown, and we conventionally have been consuming a very small population of the fish that are out there. So there's a lot that we don't know about what's happening in the water, uh, right? Bo both from just what is what the wa what the water is producing, as well as how we're manipulating it, right? On farms and feeding weird feed and things like that to fish. Uh, so I think that I think that that is probably the murkiest, grayest area. What do you so think? In, in your line of work, you need a fishmonger you can truly trust. Do you have one? Yes, I do. I, I, I use local fishers as much as possible. Yeah. I keep pushing that local agenda, Steve, but it's, I'm discovering, you know, culturally that we have commercial fisheries in Ontario that need our support. There are, in Lake Erie, uh, Lake Huron, traditionally in the last 50 years, their commerce has all been south of the border. Right. It's only been lately that we are starting to blip up on their, like there's been a real spike in local interest. I have like a personal relationship with two or three fish suppliers that I have. I remember a time um, over a decade ago, and this was like a turning point for me in how I thought about fish, and it made me think I want to go more towards the local market. I, was, I had a restaurant in the Royal Ontario Museum I was telling you about, and we had a, a visit from <clears throat> First Nations, the Hyalsuk First Nations out of BC, and I was so excited to receive them, yeah. right? Because they were, they were doing their, their big uh, ceremony downstairs. They would come up to my restaurant for lunch. I was out on the balcony grilling farm salmon, yeah. because I, was, you know, I didn't really ask that, that many questions back then. Sure. Uh, I was sure it was all cool. I started to serve it, <clears throat> and one by one, each of my guests from the House of Nation politely declined. This is anathema for a cook who wants to serve people their, their lunch. They're, they're not taking what I'm, for what I'm giving them. Why were they declining? And their, <clears throat> their reasons were, they asked me, each one, is this farm salmon or is this wild salmon? And I said, well, it's farm salmon. It's from, it's from BC. <laughs> and they said, yeah, no, we have an issue with that. And there are all kinds, I won't go into detail about all the detail around it, but the way that, that fish farming, aquaculture is being, was being practiced at that time, so I'm going back 15 years, it has uh, improved dramatically since then. But at that time, they seriously questioned how fish were being farmed, and I stopped buying it. Hmm. How about, let's do another example here. If you go into a restaurant, Yep. And if you want a nice piece of tilapia, yes, and um, you think you're getting tilapia, but in fact it's something else, it's not tilapia, yeah. but it tastes good, and you're not overpaying for it, right. at least you don't think you're overpaying for it, where's the harm in any of this? I think that the I think that the only place the harm is is the fact that we the the reality of our world is that there's more involved in the purchase and preparation and consumption of a piece of fish than just simply is this tilapia or snapper. Hmm. Right? If it was if if it was just that, then I actually don't think that's a huge issue. Mm. The bigger issue is the fact that you think it's tilapia, it actually is snapper, uh, but what are the other pieces? Where did it come from? How far did it travel to get there? What was this fish fed? What is the economic structure like? The, <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes for a lot of people to, to think about all of the details that you need to know, right? It makes it a lot easier when your pal is the, fish, is the fishmonger, mm. right? And you can go out on the boat with them and you see. Can you actually tell the difference between a... Um... Can you tell the difference between a piece of fish that's been fish farmed, uh, it's hormone free, it's antibiotic free, all of that business? On site, on a on the site, on looking at the on site, or or how about yeah. it tasting? I think that there's perhaps a more honest, authentic taste on a on a better raised piece of fish. And you can tell, but like it's because I'm I'm really dorky and serious about this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, right? It, it, maybe it's just me. A lot of my friends roll their eyes. They're like, yeah, for sure, it's just you. Well, I'd like to speak go ahead. to that issue yeah. if you don't mind. Uh, it comes back to Jamie's point about sustainability as one of the things right. that we have to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have this kind of food fraud scenario happening it's undermining some of our sustainable production systems. Uh, we see things like OceanWise putting out their guide to sustainable seafood. If I'm trying to 
vote with my wallet and make my purchasing dollars count, but I'm not getting the product I'm paying for. It's undermining consumer choice to affect mm. change in how we manage our systems. And that to me is, is a major problem. We're seeing a lot of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing products being dumped into the market. And without proper policing, we're contributing to the decimation of stocks that are being unsustainably harvested. Some of the other problems that come from substitution are that some species have uh, more toxicity than others. We've seen some cases working with the US Food and Drug Administration where people thought they were buying headless monkfish and in fact consumed pufferfish and ended up in the hospital. Because the puffer fish? It, is, it contains tetrodotoxin and it shouldn't be uh, you know, served in our, in our food supply. Huh. So there okay, are well. cases like that where there are human health implications associated with fraud. There are sustainability issues associated with fraud. And also uh, this buy local issue, uh, we've seen cases here in Ontario where I would like to buy pickerel We've got a commercial pickerel fishery on Lake Erie. I want to support domestic, you know, local fishermen. Mm -hmm. And we're ending up getting Xander from Eastern Europe. So this, as Sylvain mentioned, is artificially depressing the price, uh, stealing market share from our fishermen. And then you're getting something from Eastern Europe that may come from, a, you know, we don't really know what the environment is like there. I'm not saying that Lake Erie is pristine, but on the other hand, some of these places in Eastern Europe that have a, a heavy metal contamination of some of their waters and things wouldn't to, be what To you build think. on Bob's point, I mean, I, we can look at religions as well. I spent some time in, in Dubai a, a couple of years ago, and the whole issue of halal, certifi certifi yeah. c halal certification, kosher, mm -hmm. uh, those are big issues for, for many of our communities. And so if, if you can't really trust uh, what exactly goes on before your food gets to your plate, mm -hmm. uh, you can jeopardize a whole lot of things. Uh, now, she can tell the difference between the real deal and something that isn't because she is a self-described, what did you call yourself? Uh, you're dorky. kind of dorky that dorky way. Yeah. Yeah. You're dorky that way. <laughs> you've got a great palate. I, I do, I do. I <laughs> practice, lots of practice, yeah. yes. Most people obviously can't tell. So is this a victimless crime in that respect? I, 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 would, I would say not. I think there is, there, there's a greater victim called the food economy yeah. in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can think of a, at least a dozens of small, medium-sized businesses, family businesses, yep. and, and their whole focus is to be different, to be unique, mm. to sell a story, like Jamie's doing, uh, sell a story, sell ingredients, sell a region. That's mm. And, and if, if, you, uh, if you undermine all that, then uh, we're, we're not on solid grounds. And that's why we need to tackle food fraud as soon as possible. And, you, we can do a lot of things, and the technology that has been developed at the University of Guelph is phenomenal, but it is costly. And because uh, I, thought, I thought you were going to ask earlier to Bob how long it's going to take. Uh, my, my question would be how much it's going to cost. Okay. And so it's going to cost a whole lot. And that's why I actually do think that the, the, um, the end game is to empower the consumer with better technology. Okay, in that case, we, we're, we're not there yet, right? That day no, has no. not yet arrived. No. So in the meantime... No, because a portable device that I saw in Innsbruck was about 140,000 euros, which is prohibitive yeah. Yeah. for most of us. <laughs> for yeah. everybody, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in which case, in the interim, what do we do? Well, uh, we talk about it. Yeah. Uh, it is the big elephant in the room for, for most of the people in the food business. We all know it's happening, but we just don't know how to deal with it. And so by talking about it, by uh, actually allowing uh, technologies to become more known out there, mm -hmm. I think we're going to get somewhere. But are, are we in a world now, Jamie, let me ask you, where every time you go buy a piece of fish at the supermarket, you should be doing 20 questions with the guy behind the counter? We are. Yeah. We are in that world. And I think, you know, Josh's and I's and my position are, we are kind of in this place of influence where okay. we want to make good choices because we have a whole uh, representation like our, our people, our communities our community, that yeah. we're speaking for and we want to protect. And so it behooves us to, to be knowledgeable and make, make choices. So often we are perhaps more dogmatic 
and right. we are, and we need to be that way because it's a kind of a filter down thing. Yeah, it allows the, it allows the conversation to happen. Okay, Josh. Now I'm, here's the scene in my head: yeah. uh, St. Lawrence Market, Saturday morning, yes. 8:30 a.m. Lineup of 30 people around the counter, and you're putting the guy behind the the counter for yes. 20 questions on where was this filter? Uh, yeah. Uh, are you sure it's this and not that? Yep. And, you can have a riot on your hands if you want to do that. You can. And there's, there's two important things to say about that, right? One is even just the context of considering what fishmongers could get access to the market like the St. Lawrence is already going to tell you something about how not niche this operation is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so it's about stepping back. But the thing that I feel most important to say about this discussion is that even with a device and this incredible piece of technology, you are still going to need to know how to understand whatever the readout is on that screen, mm. right? It's still going to give you a whole set of information about whatever it is that you have just scanned, but you as the end user are still going to need to understand what that means. So lots of education. Yes, still. And, and, and nothing will absolve us of investing ourselves in learning about what's happening with our food. Right? There's, gotcha. no, there's no way through this that doesn't have us having to pay more attention to what's going on. Because even if we just get the printout of data about what this particular species of thing is, you have to understand why that's positive or negative or meaningful or not meaningful for you, right? Gotcha. Well, we're happy to strike a blow against food fraud tonight that here on TVO. It. Amen. Uh, Robert Hanner, Sylvain Charlebois, good to have you both here on TVO with us tonight. Joshna Maharaj and Jamie Kennedy on the other side of the table are familiar food faces. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.